and welcome to all of you. Today, we're thrilled to announce and present the winners of the first Positive Future contest. This contest was initiated in Paris, and although we would have loved to see you all here, this year we will be hosting this ceremony virtually due to the current sanitary circumstances. We hope that you will be able to watch and follow us from wherever you are in your part of the world. So what is Positive Future in a few words? It is an initiative that started out at the beginning of the pandemic under the leadership of two institutions, the Paris Institute for Advanced Study, a research institution, and the 2100 Foundation, which specializes in foresight. Both institutions decided to launch an annual contest in the hope of fostering positive and inspiring visions of the future on an international scale. For this first edition of the contest, the selected theme was the city, and it looks like the theme has resonated amongst people. We have received a lot of encouraging feedback from across the world and more than 300 entries for the contest. But before we find out about the winners, first, let's get some insight about the Positive Future contest itself. The Paris Institute for Advanced Study works to move the world in the right direction, fostering collective intelligence with the best of science and its institutions. If we want a livable future, we must build it. However, everywhere we only find dystopian, even apocalyptic visions of the future. But people need an incentive to build on. We want a goal, a vision of a positive, sustainable, pleasant future. A future which is realistic, however. Creating such constructive visions is the task of the Positive Future Initiative. And we have asked you to depict this good possible future in the background of your narrative. To make it feasible and realistic, our scientific advisory board has made available online documents and webinars. They show the trends as well as the technologies, lifestyles and forms of governance that could be in the future. They have also given examples of desirable futures already realized somewhere else. Because indeed, another future, another world, better than these gloomy visions, is possible. We just have to build it now. Science offers us possible ways to solve our problems. And politics offers us possible ways to live well together. But these possibilities must be known and shared. It was the purpose of this contest to produce and disseminate such visions of possible and desirable futures so that we can begin together to build them at last. The task was not easy, we know. And especially for the first year of this competition, where there was no good example to guide you. And producing something scientifically solid and artistically successful is quite a challenge. Yes, we know it. However, you did well. Thank you and congratulations for all your great stories that we will share. Thank you also to our jury who worked hard to review and select the hundreds of entries we received. We have awarded one grand prize, but all your stories contain interesting elements. Some of them particularly touched us, so we're highlighting them on the website as well. Your stories show us achievable future that are not naive paradises in which technology does not solve everything, where life is not always easy, but they are less wasteful, more respectful, more egalitarian, and less selfish. They show us worlds where we can live well in society and be happy. These futures that you show give us food for thought. They also give us hope. Let us now follow the way and build them. This first edition of the contest Positive Future was focused on the future of city. We have chosen this theme for three main reasons. Firstly, to acknowledge the fact that since 2007, more than one in two people worldwide live in a city, 60% today. Which means that for the first time in our history, human civilization has truly become urban. Secondly, 
because projecting oneself into one of the possible cities of the future enables a comprehensive reflection on the way we could live. Lifestyles, urban space, social relations, territorial relations too. Finally, because the city of tomorrow will have to tackle major challenges, both in terms of transportation and sustainability, as well as social, technological and economic changes. Thus, this theme turned out to be an excellent ground to stimulate the imagination and inspire directly exploitable courses of action. To help candidates in their reflection, we built an entire database of resources related to the city of tomorrow. Videos, articles, bibliographies, movie references, artworks, etc. We also organized various public webinars on this topic. Each of my colleagues brought their specific area of knowledge to feed this project. As far as I'm concerned, as a political scientist and a futurist, I have been analyzing the very concept of the city for many years in order to help decision makers become aware of its specificities and take into account the long-term impact of their policy. I deeply believe in the need to address societal issues through open innovation, collective intelligence and collaborative processes. This is clearly the best way to foster the impact of research and science on society. This certainty shared with all our colleagues and partners in this amazing intellectual adventure is at the core of our philosophy, together with our conviction that, yes, the future can be positive. It is only up to us to shape it. As mentioned earlier, for this first edition of the Positive Future Contest, we have received more than 300 entries, each showing different views of future cities in the form of newspaper articles, short stories or scenarios, short videos or films, or comics. Thank you to those of you who have participated. The members of our jury, which consists of experts and renowned personalities in foresight, arts, science, and policymaking, have worked throughout the summer to select the laureates, which we are excited to announce today. La première chose à laquelle nous avons été sensibles, c'est le charme des dessins, la qualité de la mise en couleur qui donne une atmosphère très, très nuancée, très contrastée, loin des chromos. Et puis la deuxième chose qui nous a frappé et séduit, c'est le thème. Euh, aborder cette histoire du point de vue d'une abeille. Alors c'est d'abord un signe très positif en soi, puisque ça veut dire que dans ce monde futur, dans plusieurs décennies, les abeilles, dont on sait à quel point elles comptent et combien elles sont menacées, les abeilles sont toujours là. Et cette abeille qui vient de naître et qui sait que sa vie sera courte, nous raconte à sa façon l'histoire d'un monde de demain qui est un monde d'après les utopies. Très longtemps, on a cru que les utopies étaient une chose vraiment positive, c'est-à-dire que l'utopie, c'était rêver demain. Mais ce que nous montre cette histoire, c'est que l'utopie peut être étouffante, écrasante, et que peut-être le monde que nous subissons aujourd'hui, et dont nous voyons les, les ravages et les dégâts sociaux, économiques, écologiques, euh, a été guidé par une utopie, par exemple euh, celle du productivisme, et que la réussite d'un monde de demain, c'est peut-être de se libérer de cette obligation de l'utopie, de cette obligation un peu totalisante, voire totalitaire de l'utopie, pour essayer simplement de restaurer les choses. Et cette abeille se présente elle-même comme une future ancêtre, ce qui en soi est un très joli mot. After reading of the Utopia and Agropolis for Future Ancestors, um, there's something that struck my mind. Uh, the first, the concept of post-Utopia. And the first time I, re I read this piece, uh, that's actually uh, with a lot of fantastic drawings, by the way, uh, I. I was a bit uncertain if I liked the term. Uh, then I read it again, and I must say, I really enjoyed it. Uh, because 
the post utopian uh, is also kind of a, the term is, is a critique of what I uh, assume are a kind of um, uh, non reflective or uh, naive utopianist uh, that they just wanted to save the world and, uh, the, and, and want to do the good things and the best things that they can imagine. And, and the result and the consequence of that is uh, not very uh, promising. Uh, and therefore, they created uh, the term post utopian, I think. And I like that. I must say, I, I, I like that uh, way of doing things. Uh, when that is said, so, some of you have to look at the content uh, as a futurist. Uh, I must say that even in the post-utopian society, uh, so after Utopia Agropolis, that uh, they describe it's. I don't know how far in the future that's actually these kind of ideas uh, are. Uh, to me, it's not very surprising. The content of the story is not that surprising to me. Uh, but you know, uh, the way they treated the the. the the telling person, the subject in the story, uh, the bee is is also interesting because the bee is a symbol of uh, environmental, uh, and very interesting environmental uh, cross challenge uh, in our time. Troisième œil, pourquoi elle a retenu mon attention Parce que d'un bout à l'autre de l'histoire, on sent que quelque chose manque et on sent que quelque chose nous est caché et ça, ça retient l'attention. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a une, une tension narrative, c'est ce qu'on cherche dans une nouvelle. Panvutu's story was definitely one of the best stories I had to read because for many years now we are looking for a transition story but most of the time is kind of technocratic, showing us a world and this story shows us first a character, someone you really want to know, you want to know what's gonna go on for this, for this person, for this woman and follower. So for once the character is the main object but at the same time gives us all the landscape of transition, talking about climate change and all the implication it has on our life and will have on our lives. So that was really interesting because you're living directly in the world because you believe in the character. Then another thing that I really liked, it was just like, it was giving us a lot of questions because that future is setting the woman in is like with positive aspect and also the complex one, like the IA, um, uh, uh, issue that you feel it's a way to go better in the future but also puts a lot of interrogation on the way you, you are, we're gonna leave and then in the end I love the idea that added to the climate issue we have a big focus on biodiversity that is not so much uh, addressed right now but it is a big issue we have to consider so really character background of transition, biodiversity, and complex questions that are all the elements that I really liked in that story, and obviously taking us in a really positive vision of the future, and I really hope that we will uh, live in that future altogether. When I first read uh, the short story, The Reconciliation of Knoll, uh, I was reflecting, should I read it through my lens as a futurist or should I read it uh, through my lens as a, you know, a literature uh, evaluator or something like that? So I choose the first. I'm, I'm, I'm actually a futurist and I, what I see in this short story is uh, some of the interesting reflection on uh, not necessarily a future debate on uh, the role of technology and the social uh, development and the role of social innovations, uh, but it's also a kind of a critique of uh, one line a year, uh, techno-optimistic techno approach among a lot of people uh, today. Uh, so the, uh, how they describe the way from Helios to Knoll, I think it's interesting in the sense that they uh, represent a kind of a critique of this uh, techno-optimism. Cette fois-ci, c'est plus l'aspect descriptif de, de l'histoire qui m'a intéressé. On nous montre un Paris qui est devenu une sorte de petite Venise dans lequel les champs élysées sont devenus un fleuve et ça donne envie en fait de s'y promener. Donc on a envie d'être projeté dans ce Paris futuriste. Viva
Vivaldi de Milsan nous fait vivre quatre saisons dans une ville de Lyon très largement végétalisée. Dans cette ville, l'entraide collective a permis de s'adapter au mieux au bouleversement climatique. La BD montre aussi l'interdépendance des populations dans le monde et comment les villes, prenant le relais des États, collaborent et partagent leurs expériences. Cette très jolie BD a retenu notre attention car elle propose une vision réaliste et crédible d'un futur dans lequel, certes, tout n'est pas rose, mais où les efforts et la responsabilité de tous permettent une vie meilleure, plus sobre, mais aussi plus solidaire. Nous avons aussi particulièrement apprécié le fait que cette œuvre s'appuie sur des travaux de prospective et soit le produit d'un travail collectif. En ce qui concerne les œuvres, nous avions tous nos préférences. Il y en a une que j'ai bien aimée, c'est une bande dessinée qui s'appelle « Vivaldi 2100 » et qui nous montre un échange entre deux chercheurs, une chercheuse chinoise et un chercheur lyonnais, et qui montre de façon vraiment assez réaliste et très bien documentée la manière dont pourraient se, se gérer au niveau local les grands changements climatiques et les différences qu'il peut y avoir entre une façon très technologique et une façon, on va dire, plus... Euh, euh, soutenable et basé sur l'économie locale et surtout sur des changements de politique locale et de démocratie locale, de décision. Je trouve que c'était très bien fait et assez, assez réaliste et ça m'a donné à réfléchir sur le, ce que ça allait être de vivre avec, comment dire, très peu d'émissions carbone, c'est-à-dire en se tenant aux objectifs qu'on s'est fixés. C'est intéressant, ça ne va pas être simple, c'est faisable, c'est sympa, c'est différent. Et ça sous-entend beaucoup de différences dans la vie quotidienne au niveau de la gestion locale et de la politique par rapport à ce qu'on fait actuellement. The short story Waiting for Cleo takes us to year 2105. Paris has no more cars, no pollution, no more incessant noise. It's very hot, but it's good to live there. Vertical farms, buildings with high altitude, rooftop forests, artificial lakes for collecting wastewater have emerged along with new technologies, drones and high-speed transportation. On May 21st, 2105, we follow Auguste and discover his daily life. Auguste is waiting for Cleo, but Cleo will not come. She has left for Mars. Auguste could join her if he wanted to, but why should he? Waiting for Cleo, whose title is reminiscent of Beckett's Waiting for Godot, is a universal story about love and waiting. What is happiness about? Isn't it just right here? You might also find yourself reflecting on such questions while reading this wonderful story. Ce qui est très réussi dans le texte que le jury a choisi de, de primer euh, en attendant Cléo, ce qui est très réussi, c'est d'avoir finalement contourné ces deux difficultés. Oui, le texte nous présente un monde futur, mais il ne nous le décrit pas de manière trop laborieuse, trop détaillée, il nous le fait sentir, palper, deviner à travers euh, les actions des personnages, surtout du personnage principal. Et la deuxième qualité, c'est d'avoir euh, introduit une forme de mélancolie à l'intérieur de euh, ce futur positif et heureux. D'avoir dit qu'au fond, même si le monde change, même si les intentions sociales, politiques changent, même si les grandes difficultés climatiques ou autres que nous rencontrons aujourd'hui sont vaincues, les sentiments humains, eux, ne changeront pas tant que ça. Et que l'attente amoureuse, la crainte, une forme de nostalgie ou de mélancolie seront toujours là. Et je pense que c'est cela qui donne à cette nouvelle son prix, 
c'est qu'elle nous fait véritablement entrer dans un futur auquel nous croyons, parce qu'il reste un futur humain, un futur où tout n'est pas rose, car nous le savons bien, quelles que soient les innovations qu'on peut introduire, la pire des utopies serait celle du bonheur obligé pour toutes et pour tous, car ce serait l'extinction de ces sentiments, de ces rêveries, de ces fantasmes qui font le prix de nos vies. The writing style in An Attendant Cléo is very fresh and very direct. We don't really have a lot of information about this relationship. We just see this man waiting and clearly longing to meet this woman. But what I find really interesting is the fact that maybe the world, the city, the planet that um, this story is set in is very different from what we live today. But despite all these changes, we care a lot about what is happening here. And even if it's not so dramatic, we really identify with this man. And this shows us that somehow, no matter how much things can change and uh, everyday life can be different, there is still something that is going to connect us with the people who are going to live this new world in the future. We now come to the end of the first edition of the Positive Future Contest. Special congratulations to the winners. You can now see their works on our website, www.positive futureorg Next year, the theme for the second edition of the contest is work in 2100, a subject that we're most likely to be all concerned about. We hope to see you again and discover your inspiring views around the future of work. Again, thank you all for participating in this initiative and sharing your positive visions of the future. See you next year. <laughs>